One cold night in the wilderness near Wyoming, Natalie ran barefoot through the snow while crying in fear because she was being chased by something scary. She fell and tried to get up, but ended up lying helpless on the ground. Meanwhile Corey works for the wildlife department as a hunter, and is camouflaged in all white when he hunts wild wolves that have been harassing livestock in the area, and he shoots when he gets the right shot. After the hunt is over, Corey visits his ex-wife Wilma's house with the intention of picking up his son Casey, to take him to the Indian reservation so he can hang out with his maternal grandparents during the school holidays while his mother is away. Corey and Wilma still try to maintain a good relationship between them. However, the trauma resulting from the loss of their daughter several years ago still haunts Wilma's mind, making her more protective of her son, so she reminds Corey to make sure Casey is always under her supervision. Upon arrival, Crowheart tells Corey about a series of vicious predator attacks in their area that have recently damaged livestock, and Corey quickly deduces that the lion is the culprit just by looking at the footprints carved into the ground. In an attempt to track the lion's whereabouts, Corey takes his snowmobile deeper into the forest, where he sees footprints and frozen blood in the snow, each step he follows brings him to the horrific reality of seeing Natalie's body lying on the ground. Corey recognized her, and he immediately reported this grisly discovery to the reservation's chief of police Ben Shoyo, and together they decided to contact the FBI to handle the case while waiting at Crowhart's house. Time continued to pass, making Corey increasingly anxious and planning to pick up Natalie alone, but his hopes were fulfilled when an FBI agent Jane Banner appeared from the middle of a snowstorm. Jane didn't have any preparations because she flew directly from outside the city and looked uncomfortable with the cold weather in the area. So Casey's grandmother lends her some of her late granddaughter warm clothes to survive the cold woods, but reminds her to return them when she's finished. After that, they rode a snowmobile together to the location where Natalie's body was found. Jane carefully examined the body closely, looking for injuries that might provide clues and she firmly concluded that this was a murder case. Jane then asked Corey about nearby places that might be an escape for Natalie. Corey immediately mentioned Sam Little Feather's house in the drilling platform which was about 7 kilometers to the southeast. Corey then reconstructs Natalie's escape route by examining footprints, the deeper the footprints became, the clearer it became that Natalie was trying hard to escape. He also explained that the low temperature in the area could reach 20 degrees Celsius at night, causing her lungs to explode until she fell and coughed up blood, but she continued running until her last breath. Jane realizes that all of the information makes sense, and after observing Corey's investigative skills, she without hesitation enlists his help in further investigation. Later that night, an inquisitive Casey begins to ask questions about the dead woman, and finally correctly predicts that Natalie died in the exact same way as his sister. The next day, Jane and Ben went to the medical examiner's office to find out more, where they met Randy Whitehurst, a well-known post-mortem doctor in the area. Randy explained in detail the wounds found on Natalie's body and concluded that Natalie had been the victim of a sexual attack by an as-yet-unidentified perpetrator. However his death was caused by the cold piercing her lungs causing her to die alone. Jane feels she has a moral obligation to thoroughly investigate this case, but is increasingly frustrated because this incident is not considered a murder. She realized that asking the FBI team for help was impossible as this incident was outside their jurisdiction or perhaps he would have been pulled back from the case. After that, Ben took Jane to meet Natalie's parents, Martin and Annie, while Corey would follow them. Martin admits that Natalie does have a boyfriend, but they don't even know his name. Jane became annoyed, and she accused Martin of being an irresponsible father towards his daughter, which made Martin feel humiliated and unhappy. Jane tries to talk to Annie, but she is discouraged when she sees a mother so devastated after losing her daughter that she hurts herself. Corey arrives not long after, and it turns out he is one of Martin's closest friends. Corey tries to share his experience of his daughter's death, trying to help Martin overcome the trauma he experienced by accepting it and embracing his pain. Martin hasn't recovered yet and while lighting a cigarette, he finally learns that Corey is involved in an investigation that seems to have the same motives as him, so he asks Corey to take revenge for his daughter's death. After that, they head to a dilapidated house on the reservation where Sam Littlefeather lives, a drug addict who has had frequent run-ins with the law and is on parole. Sam panics when he finds out that the FBI has come looking for him, so he sprays tear gas at Ben and Jane, making them foam and have a coughing fit, while the other two addicts try to escape through the back door. But Corey swiftly caught them with a shovel blow to causing them both to fall to the ground. Jane regained her vision moments later, and began following Sam around the house, when suddenly Sam appears and shoots at her, but Jane manages to return the blow and even ends up killing him. Ben tells Jane that one of the men is Chip Hansen, Natalie's addicted brother, while the other is Frank Walker, whose father was in prison for robbing a woman's purse and has not yet been released. Chip can't hide his tears when he hears the bad news about his sister, but his ambiguous remarks help Jane realize that Natalie's boyfriend is a white non-local. Corey notices snowmobile tracks from the house leading up the hill where Natalie's body was found, but there are no tracks of the car coming back. Corey and Jane finally take a snowmobile up a hill to investigate, but decide to walk along the trail because the terrain is difficult to navigate, and find the submerged body of a naked man who had been partially eaten by an eagle. Afterwards, Ben says that the two addict boys are still reluctant to give any information, and are convinced that they would rather be in prison than on the reservation. Corey decides to talk to Chip directly because he has known him since childhood. 
Chip blames the harsh environment for what happened to him and his sister, and also blames Cory for failing to protect his own daughter, resulting in his being beaten in return. Cory gives him advice about the many opportunities he has wasted to get better, and Chip finally reveals the identity of Natalie's boyfriend as Matt, a man who works as a security guard at an oil rig. Cory tells Ben about this information, and Ben asks Cory to accompany them to the drilling later, but Cory gives an answer that seems like he has a different plan. After that, Jane stops by Cory's place and tells him that the identity of the body on the hill is Matt Raburn, Natalie's boyfriend who works at the drilling rig whose name Chip mentioned earlier. Jane notices a photo of his daughter on the table, and Cory begins to tell a sad story similar to Natalie's that happened to Emily three years ago when she was 16 years old. Cory who worked as a salesman at that time, wanted to spend the night alone with his wife at a hotel, but they received news from Natalie who was her best friend that Emily had disappeared. Cory was unable to continue the story, but finally he reluctantly revealed that Natalie's body was found several days later mutilated by a wolf. Jane was shaken by the horrific story, and asked permission to go to the bathroom, she then finds one of the poems written by Emily, showing that she was a talented writer. The next day, Jane and Ben accompanied by four other deputies from the police, went with a sled to an oil drilling facility, while Corey went up the hill alone to investigate further about Matt's murder. When they got there, they were greeted by one of the security officers and they asked about Matt's whereabouts, the security guard replies that he also hopes to have the answer because Matt has been missing since an argument with his girlfriend three days ago. Jane noticed the bruised face of the security guard, as well as on the faces of two other security officers who had just come down, who they explained that the injuries were caused by hitting a tree branch while riding a sled in the area. But Jane is still suspicious as they walk towards Matt's caravan, so she uses a deception technique to see their reaction by saying that Natalie has made a report about her missing boyfriend. The security leader responds in disbelief, saying that it's impossible, because they heard the news about Natalie's body being found a few days ago on the radio. Jane's suspicions grow stronger, stating that Natalie's name was never mentioned on the radio. At that moment, one of the policemen noticed the movement of the guards who were trying to flank them from behind, and he panicked. A standoff ensued and everyone started drawing their weapons. Luckily, Jane's rank as an FBI agent is higher than the other officers, so she takes care of the situation and brings everyone back to their senses. They continued on to Matt's caravan, and Jane opened the door. Suddenly the film rewinds to the last night Natalie and Matt open the door to greet them with hugs and kisses. In bed, Natalie and Matt excitedly talk about their future plans to run away together, but Matt's co-workers enter the caravan, and a drunken Pete pulls back the curtains and starts flirting with them on the bed, making Matt lose his temper and push him back. Pete doesn't seem to give up, he jumps back saying that he also wants to take part, while one of the men insults Natalie with a racist comment which causes Natalie to slap him in the face. Pete pulls down Natalie's pants, causing him to take several hits from Matt, and a brawl begins as the other men try to grab Matt and beat him. Natalie tries to help her boyfriend, but she and Matt are knocked unconscious after being hit hard in the head. Pete begins to rape her, but Matt awakens from his stupor, bypassing all the men to defeat Pete once again. But the men started beating him severely, while Natalie managed to escape knowing that she couldn't do anything to help her boyfriend. In the present, Jane is still screaming and banging on the door, while in the mountains Corey notices a car trail from the drilling camp that leads to where Matt's body was found. This proved that the guards had taken Matt's body up the hill after killing him, while trying to mislead the investigation process. Corey immediately gets on the sled and tries to warn Ben about the guards, but Jane is shot from inside the caravan before she can get away from the door. Massive firefights from both sides could not be avoided, but eventually the guards managed to take over and killed all the officers. Jane was still alive thanks to the bulletproof vest she was wearing and managed to kill one of the guards, but the head guard grabbed her gun as she was about to reload and promised to kill her. Suddenly, a strange sound was heard from the top of the hill as an unexpected bullet from Corey shot through the head guard's body and killed him. The other men panic and wonder where the shots came from, but they too were quickly killed before even finding an answer, including one of the men in the caravan. But Pete managed to escape after breaking the window and fleeing into the woods. Corey finds an injured Jane and takes her into the trailer to get first aid, but Jane was well aware that taking her to the city was the only way to save her life, so she convinces Corey to continue chasing Pete while she calls a helicopter. At the top of the hill, Pete hears a strange noise and frantically looks around, he turns around and Corey knocks him unconscious. Corey takes him to the top of a mountain in the region, and Pete finds his hands tied while his toes have shown frostbite. Corey promises him a second chance if he admits to what they did, and Pete quickly admits that they were the ones who killed Matt and raped Natalie. Corey keeps his promise and allows her to go, commenting that Natalie ran 10 miles barefoot in the snow and that she wasn't sure she would make it to 600 feet. Pete started running after Corey gave him a warning, but it only took a few steps for the air on Gannett Mountain to explode his lungs like it did to Natalie. He fell to the ground while remembering and died on the spot. A few days later, Corey visits Jane in the hospital, where she feels lucky to have survived, while Corey believes that luck has no place on the reservation, he stated that it was her zest for life and strength that had made her persevere, or give up because he didn't. Jane cried as she recalled Natalie running 10 miles in minus zero conditions to save her life. 
and how the film ends, Corey visits Martin at his home and finds him with his new death face indicating that he is going to commit suicide to make him feel better. Trying to cheer her up, Corey explains how each of the men responsible for Natalie's death were sentenced to execution, especially the man who abused Natalie who died whimpering. Martin starts to feel emotional and asks Corey to sit with him for a moment, to share in his grief over the loss of a daughter in such a horrific way. Undoubtedly, the event has changed their perception of pain, prompting one of them to consider suicide, while the other feels inspired to become stronger inside. Ultimately, both symbols of weakness and strength are before us, just as we face every challenge in everyday life, and we must choose how we want to respond. This story depicts the complexity of emotions and life choices each character faces in overcoming tragedy and loss.